Your fire is going to warm people this winter. Don't lose it. You don't talk <laughs> like a, a member of Congress. Don't ever start. Congresswoman-elect Cori Bush, feels great to say that, made an appearance on MSNBC with Ali Velshi discussing poverty. Now, I got a couple clips here to show you. I'm also going to go over some data showing you how things have drastically changed over the past 30 years. And uh, I also got a little credit, or I, I'm going to give a little credit to Ali Velshi, uh, especially after the second clip. I was surprised, but he is Canadian, so he has a different perspective than uh, a lot of people on U.S. media, in U.S. media do. But first, let me show you the, uh, the first clip here. Cori Bush discussing what it's like to be poor. Florida, by the way, passed an ordinance in this uh, election to raise minimum wage to $15. The minimum wage in this country is $7.25 an hour, a wage uh, which amounts to $15,000 a year. $15, $15 a year is about $31,000 a year. And yet we have people out there who think that's thievery, that that is a giveaway uh, to people. You understand on a very personal level what it's like to make certain choices, including choices about your children eating or you eating or what you buy or where you get your food. Yes, I've had to live um, where, you know, it's one thing to know that I can't eat today. And I'm, but I'm making sure my children eat. It's another thing. It's a, a, it does something to your mind when you know, not only am I not eating today, I don't know how I'm going to eat next week. You know, I'm trying to pay my bills. You're reaching out to family and friends to try to help you, but you can only, your family and friends, that network is in the same boat as you. So you can't pull from other people's, be, other people being poor is so expensive, you know, and that's something that I saw when we talk about, um, you know, uh, $15 an hour, $15 an hour, minimum wage like that is some huge deal. Let me tell you, when you have to pay childcare, when you have to pay your bills, when you have to take care of yourself, have money left over to save. And then when you look like me and you want to add wage inequality, you want to add racial, that racial wage gap into that, you're allowing people to struggle, un struggle unnecessarily in this country. We said $15 an hour. We're not trying to make any, we're not talking about making anybody rich. No we're talking rich about taking people from starvation. No, starvation to living. That's all we're asking for. From starvation to living. I think that's a phrase that should be used more often. 15 bucks an hour is simply moving you from starvation to living. And really, it's not nearly enough. I'll get to that uh, in a chart in a minute. But first, I just want to say, these conversations are so incredibly rare on cable news. If you watched any of the coverage after Joe Biden's victory over the weekend, they had on moderate after conservative after moderate after conservative i mean they're all conservatives but i did not see one working class voice like cory bush on there discussing the joe biden victory and what she's going to be fighting for in congress not one they had on john Kasich, you know joe scarborough go down the list just a bunch of republicans and a bunch of uh conservative democrats on to uh, discuss the joe biden victory again the framing from these networks, understand, they are from a pro-corporate perspective. As these massive corporations running the show, obviously they have their own agenda to push. People thinking that they're watching, you know, CNN or MSNBC or, of course, you know, Fox News. People thinking that they're watching that, getting some sort of objective information. You're not. Yes, of course, they cover the news, which is important. But when it comes to an analysis on the economy, an analysis on how people in the country are doing, you rarely ever get these sorts of conversations so whenever you know someone like this appears i'm going to cover it because i want to encourage these sorts of guests on the network but of course um they have a certain agenda to push and they're not going to prop up voices like this let me get to some charts here before i get to the second clip this is from the economic policy institute this is back in 2015 the charts that i'm going to show you i'm not going to show you all nine but i'll link to this below the video you can go through them all yourself but um since this is from 2015, it's only gotten worse since then. And you can imagine with COVID making it much, much worse. But let me show you exactly where things sit right now in the country. So this is a uh, chart here showing workers produced much more, but typical workers pay lagged far behind. Disconnect between productivity and typical workers' compensation, 1948 to 2013. So you see here, up until about 1973, Productivity and hourly compensation rose in tandem. And then, 
at around 1973, 1974, it broke. And you see here for the past, you know, 40 plus years, you've had a massive increase, or I should say a continued increase in productivity. Meanwhile, hourly compensation has just completely stagnated. And I will get to some reasoning as to why this is the case. But showing you here, if um, the minimum wage rose with productivity, right now it would be $18. So a $15 minimum wage is actually the conservative position. It is not a left-wing position. It is a conservative position because based on productivity, right now the minimum wage should be at eighteen forty-two, And I, I, I guess even higher now, actually, since this is 2015. Um, recent estimates put it somewhere around... Uh, 22 bucks an hour. So nowhere near the $15 that people are currently fighting for. The conversation really has to change. 15 bucks an hour isn't enough. So at some point, if it's accomplished, immediately, um, the fight should be for much more than 15. When it comes to the pace of annual pay increases, the top 1% wage grew 138% since 1979, while wages for the bottom 90% of people grew only 15 so this showing you between 1979 to 2013 you see here top one percent massive increase in their wages meanwhile the bottom 90 percent vast majority of people tiny increase in wages two more charts here ceos now make 296 times what a typical worker earns you see this was not the norm back in the early 1970s or late 1960s 1970s and then 1980 with the beginning of Reaganomics, you see here uh, a small jump, and then it really jumps up in the 1990s and the 2000s. CEOs make way too much compared to what their workers that actually produce the goods, that actually bring in the profits for them. CEOs make uh, a lot more than they should. Last graph here. Decline in union membership. So this is a big reason for all of the previous graphs that you just saw. This is a big reason for the massive gap in wealth inequality. Decline in union membership mirrors income gains of top uh, 10%. Union membership and share of income going to the top 10%, 1917 to 2012. So you see here back in the uh, 1920s, the existence of unions, incredibly low. But then at around uh, 1944, 1945, going till about the 1960s, you had a high rate of unionization leading to people being able to benefit from the wealth that was generated. And then as unions declined over the 1970s, 80s, 2000s, you see the uh, share of the income going to the top 10%. Meanwhile, everybody else getting screwed. So understand that the existence of unions doesn't just benefit people in unions, it also benefits all workers because it sets a sort of standard that is expected when it comes to what you should be getting from your employer. So with the lack of unions out there, the standards are lower. All right, second clip. Now this really for me is, uh, I mean, Ali Velshi here, fantastic job, surprisingly for a MSNBC host, but um, fantastic job and Corey Bush as well discussing more of her experience uh, in, uh, in poverty. But here's the thing, uh, your story is not unique. There are, uh, the Reverend Dr. William Barber reminds us all the time, there are something like 50 million people who are food insecure. What you described is not knowing where your next meal is coming from. That's food insecurity. There are 50 million people in the world's richest country, in the world's greatest democracy, in the place that is supposed to lead the world. 50 million of our people are, are in that position. 500,000 people slept outside or did not sleep in their own homes or their own beds last night. More people will be put out of their houses because of coronavirus, because they've been out of a job. This is not a weird one-off thing. There are more people food insecure in America, then there are people in the country that I come from of Canada. Mm. 
my goodness. And you know what? It's going to continue this way until we have some radical change. And, you know, people push back when we talk about the things that we need. So look, it, locally, we decided we're tired of seeing people hungry. We're tired of seeing our, our unhoused population sleeping on the street. That's our community. So you know what? If our local government won't do it, if our state won't do it, if they don't understand it, look, I've slept in my car. I know what it's like to try to move the car around the St. Louis area, hoping that the police won't stop me and take my kids from me. You know, I know what that's like. You know, I don't want that for anybody else. So we're in the street, 20 degrees, you know, uh, zero degrees outside. We're out in the street when it's 100 degrees, making sure that people get to a safe place, you, making sure that people have food to eat. And then the other thing is you can't just tell people to go get food. And then how if, if you give me some, some money to go get food and I walk into the store and they push me back out because I'm, I have a disheveled look, you know, or because I have a smell. Well, did you also offer me a place to take a shower? Where am I supposed to use the restroom? You know, so we have to think about that. You have to wrap around people. You can't just say, well, I'm going to give you food. And if you think about it, if you've never been in the, the situation where you had to go to food pantries, I've been there. You know what? You can go to the food pantry once a month. You know, you have to go shop around and find different food pantries to make sure. And then you go to some food pantries and the food is old. It's expired. You know, so we have to do better taking care of our own people in our communities. Your fire is going to warm people this winter. Don't lose it. You don't talk <laughs> like a, a member of Congress. Don't ever start. That last piece of advice there from Ali Velshi may be the best piece of advice I've ever heard from any cable news host. You don't talk like a member of Congress. Don't start. It's because Cori Bush is an actual representative of the working class. Her experiences that she shared here uh, on, the, uh, on the network... They're alien to 99% of people in Congress. Most people in Congress come from wealth. They have no idea what it's like to actually be poor, to live the experiences that Cori Bush has lived. She has this perspective that very few others have. And bringing that experience into this fight for the working class makes a difference. And right now, what you have in Congress is a shrinking conservative Democratic bloc, the only members of the House that lost their seat in the Democratic Party were all conservative pro-corporate Democrats. So they lost seats while progressives gained. They gained Cori Bush, Jamal Bowman, and, and a few others. So you have this increase in a progressive working class uh, minded voting bloc. Meanwhile, conservative pro-corporate Democrats are shrinking, meaning that when it comes to actual legislation, you have a powerful block here that is going to be able to push for some actual changes. Now, of course, the barrier being the Senate, Democrats don't have the Senate. They could potentially uh, tie it or have it with uh, the two Georgia Senate, Senate races, uh, runoff races coming up. But even then, you can't rely on people like Joe Manchin in the Senate to vote with Democrats. So, you know, while it's impossible to imagine any real piece of legislation that is actually uh, for the working class getting through the Senate. At the very least, what you will have is a public fight of the working class versus these pro-corporate Democrats. Because people like Cori Bush are not going away. They're just going to continue speaking up. The fight is going to be public. So while in the past, you know, it's been mostly people, you know, on the Internet discussing the need for Democrats to actually represent the working class, you now have a massive voting bloc in Congress with the White House being Democratic, meaning that they no longer have to focus on stopping Donald Trump. The actual focus gets to be neoliberalism versus the working class. So that's the fight that I'm looking forward to. And Cori Bush is going to be one of the, the big voices out there pushing for the working class. Last thing, I just got to give credit here to Ali Velshi. I mean, it is rare to have these sorts of conversations on cable news. He is Canadian, like myself, so... <laughs> you know, brings a different perspective. Maybe that's why he's a little more open to these ideas. But um, it was great there to see him bring up uh, food insecurity, poverty, and how, you know, right now in America, I'm not sure the exact number, but there are uh, tens of millions of people in the U.S. that don't know where they're getting their, their, uh, their next meal. And that is completely insane. You have 30 to 40 million people potentially being evicted in part due to the due to uh, the pandemic, but in part also due to the fact that they were before the pandemic living paycheck to paycheck. So any, you know, these economic indicators that 
the media often loves to, you know, look, look toward, oh, unemployment rate is down. Well, great. How much are people actually making, though? That is the major issue. How much are you actually taking home? What's the cost of housing? Do they have to pay for health care? What's the cost of health care? Do they have health care through their employer? Because those benefits are also declining. So the actual indicators in terms of telling or, uh, or recognizing how the country is doing is looking at food insecurity, looking at poverty, looking at how much people are actually making. Are they living paycheck to paycheck? The cost of housing? Have wages increased with productivity over the past 30 years? I just showed you they didn't. They haven't. So there has to be or there is going to be more of a focus now on what the working class needs, because no longer do we have the distraction of Donald Trump. We get to actually focus on neoliberalism versus the working class. And the facts are on the side of the working class.